Let's start. Meetings called to order. City Clerk. Council Member Agency Director Mann. Present. Marcus. Here. Cilio. Here. Vice Mayor, Vice Chairman Smith. Here. Mayor Chairman Paris. Here. We have a quorum. Tonight, uh, the invocation will be done by Assistant Pastor Tim Christensen at Lancaster Baptist Church. Oh, hi, Tim. Good evening. On behalf of Pastor Chapel and the Lancaster Baptist family, I want to thank the council and the citizens for their continued efforts. And you're making a difference. And uh, thank you for doing so. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we consider Memorial Day, we thank you for the freedoms we enjoy as Americans. May we not take them for granted. May we not abuse them. And may we not forget those who have paid a price to secure them and obtain them for us. We understand that freedom is your idea and that spiritual freedom comes from a relationship with you. We thank you for that. We pray that you would protect our service men and women. We pray that you would keep them safe as they serve in all four corners of the earth tonight. We pray that you would help those Lancaster residents who have lost a loved one to war to sense our deep gratitude for them and our appreciation for them. I pray that as their neighbors we would be instruments of your grace in their lives. We thank you for the efforts of our council and of our citizens and of our city staff. Uh, we pray that you would give each of them wisdom as we continue to work toward uh, having a a great place to call home. We pray that you would uh, give each of these leaders, as well as each in our community, not only wisdom and guidance, but also your presence. And help those of us who serve uh, churches and congregations in this community to do our, our very best to come alongside of the citizens, as well as elected officials, and make a difference together. We thank you for what you're doing in our families and in our homes and on our streets. Uh, thank you for those who are protecting our safety and uh, for those who are serving our community. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. And Councilwoman Marcus. Please join me in um, pledging the flag, right hand over the heart. Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we have a student speaker. Yes, we have a student speaker tonight, and that is Armando Carlos. He is 11 years old, is a sixth grader at Tamara School, and he's going to um, he's going to give a speech to us tonight. Come on up here, Armando. Armando Carlos. Armando Carlos. Is that what she said? Here, go ahead and take my mic. Good evening. My name is Armando and today my subject is Memorial Day. Everybody loves a holiday. It is very nice to have a day off work to spend with the family or do a variety of fun things, even if it is just to sleep late. But sometimes we tend to forget the real significance of this special day, why it was established in the first place. How many of us remember the origin of Memorial Day? We might appreciate it a bit more if we were reminded of its origin and history. What we call Memorial Day was earlier known as Decoration Day. No one is exactly sure when or where it began. The first official proclamation of Memorial Day was by General John Logan in May 1868 when flowers were placed on the graves of Union and Confederate soldiers at Arlington National Cemetery. By 1890, Memorial Day is recognized by all northern states, but the South did not join in until after World War I. After that, the day was changed to honor not only Civil War soldiers, but soldiers who died in any war. For some time, the day for Memorial Day was to be May 30th, but in 1971, Congress set the last Monday in May as the official date. Many people use this day to place flowers on the graves of not only fallen soldiers, but also on the graves of loved ones. Memorial Day is just what the name implies. It is a day to remember, and not only to remember, 
but also to appreciate. Hopefully, all of us will find it in our hearts to do more than relax in the backyard on this special day, but we'll take some time to reflect on the blessings we enjoy based on a heavy price paid by many before us. Thank you. Give me a second, I'll figure all this out. Okay, we have some presentations. We have two recipients of the Mayor's Athlete of the Month Award, uh, both from Paraclete High School. That's Ashley Woodford and Melanie's Chapman. Both from Paraclete. Are they here? Come on down. So, how did we get a tie? I guess so. This is, well, I guess I'm going to tell you in a moment. Ashley, are you Ashley? Yeah. Ashley is one of the fastest girls in the state of California. One of the fastest. She is ranked fifth overall in the 100 meters and is the number one ranked senior in the state. She is in the top 20 nationwide. That means the Olympics soon, huh? That is truly, take a look at her. You've seen her here. You're going to see her in the Olympics. This is incredible. <laughs> Ashley finished third in the state among freshmen in 2006 and first among sophomores in 2007 in the 100 meters. How come it took you so long to get up here? I mean, <laughs> Ashley won the Summer Regional Championships, Southern California, Nevada, and Hawaii in the 100 and 200 meters in 2008 and the 100 meters in 2007. She placed fifth in the 10th grade division in the National USA Track and Field Junior Olympics in 2007. Ashley was named all leg in the 100 meters, 200 meters, four, what's it, 400 relay? Okay. In grades 9 through 12, she was named Athlete of the Year at Paraclete. I can see why. Ashley received the prestigious California Scholarship Federation Award and is a member of the National English Honor Society. Ashley maintains a 4.0 GPA and, and was awarded Paraclete St. Francis of Azizi Award. Did I get that right? Okay. For religious studies, Ashley has volunteered at the annual Cancer Walk, the Youth Center at Fort MacArthur, and Feed the Children program. Oh, there's more. <laughs> she is the founder and president of the Women's Christian Club and is a member of the Gospel Keys and the New Life Christian Club. Ashley accepted a full scholarship at the University of Pittsburgh and plans to become a sports medicine physician. Wow. She was also offered a scholarship to Boston University. You turned down Georgetown? <laughs> I've never met anybody who turned down Georgetown ever. <laughs> wow. I would have died to send one of my kids to Georgetown <laughs> and several other major universities. For her outstanding accomplishments in sports, academics, and leadership, we would pre we're presenting Ashley Woodford, the Mayor's Athlete of the Month Award. And we're going to give you a Mayor's $1,000 scholarship. On top of that, you are the first recipient. Congratulations. You see, you see that guy right there? He's got your check. I'm really proud that you're from Lancaster. Now, we have, uh oh. Melanie's, is that, is that how you pronounce it, Melanie's? Is one of the fastest sprinters in the state of California. She is ranked third overall in the 100 meters and is the number two ranked senior in the state. She is in the top 20 nationwide. She is ranked ninth in California in the 200 meters. And is the, did they recruit you guys? How do you get two of these in the same school? This, <laughs> this is really cool. Melanie's holds the the Paraclete High School records in the 100 meters, 200 meters, 400 meters, and the 4400 and the 4100 meter relays. 
As a junior, she was named the first team All Valley Press and second team Daily News squads. Melanie's helped lead the Paraclete track and field team to the Alpha League titles during all four of her years at the school. She was three-time Alpha League champion in sprints as well as a finalist in the CIF prelims and finals. You know, I never had two pages. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> She starred on the varsity basketball team for three years, earning captain status and first team all league honors. She was a member of the Masters varsity track team during her junior season. She maintains a 372 GPA in honors classes. Now, you all know what honors classes is. That's when they pa pass the test, they get college credit. That's just not your regular high school class. These kids work and work really hard. She's a uh, a member of the National Honor Society, the Eng English National Honor Society, the Spanish National Honor Society, the African Heritage Club, and the Key Club. Melanie's has volunteered for the Children's Sunday School, Children's Basketball Camp, and at the Los Angeles County Library. She was awarded Paraclete Scholar Athlete Award this year and has been elected student body officer two times. She was accepted a full scholarship at the University of California, Davis and she stayed home. <laughs> For her outstanding accomplishments in sports, academics, leadership, I would like to present Melanie's Chapman, the Mayor's Athlete of the Month Award, and we're going to give you $1,000 also. Now, the $1,000, as soon as you start your first day of class, you get the check, and you can do with it what you want. So you can, you know, have some spending money. But first, I want to know what are you going to do? What are you going to be? Wow! And they're science majors. Wow! Thank you. Thank you very much. We have. Uh, Mike Bradley from the Los Angeles County Fire Department. Is Mike here? Hi, Mike. How are you? Now, Mike's the guy I want next time I go to the gym, as you see me sweating here like somebody overweight and out of shape. Uh, because Mike was at 24 Hour Fitness in Lancaster. When a patron was using the treadmill collapsed, he was not, the man was not breathing and did not have a pulse. That could happen to me. <laughs> Mike Bradley began chest compressions, which immediately revived the man, who was then transported to the hospital and reported resting comfortably. Whereas Mike Bradley is an Animal Valley native who graduated from Courts Hill High School and followed his father into the profession of firefighting. Whereas Mike Bradley has a commendable attitude, genuine desire to help people whenever he can, he is an outstanding example of the community spirit. Now, therefore, the Lancaster City Council commands Firefighter Specialist Mike Bradley for his exemplary service to the community. Thank you, Mike. You know, we see it on television all the time when people revive somebody who's, who's stopped, their heart stopped beating. Rarely does it work, isn't that true? Yeah. To, to actually bring him back is, is truly, that, that had to have been instant. That's wonderful. Thank you. And now my favorite guys in the whole world is the Lancaster Gang Task Force. Would you guys come on down? You have changed the world starting in Lancaster. You know, I've got something I'm going to read here, but first I want to tell you a little bit about what these guys have done. Do you realize that Lancaster has dropped gang violence 80%? Gang violence 80% in one year. And these are the people who did it. You know, everybody uh, stands in line to get a little bit of the credit for the work you guys did. But what you did, these are the people who did the work. And they did it in ways that had never been done before. And I don't know that there's another city that could make that claim. You know, it's, we're, they're doing wonderful work on arresting gangbangers and suppressing gangs. But more importantly, they 80% on gang violence. 
I mean, that's how many 10, 15, 20 people that are alive today because of their efforts. You know, it's the stuff we don't see that makes the huge difference. Whereas beginning in April 2008, the Antelope Valley Gang Task Force conducted a federal and state investigation on the Lancus 13 criminal street gang. I got to go with them on this. This was really cool. They took up the whole gang in about three hours. It was the most amazing thing. And not only did they arrest the entire gang, they did it without anybody getting hurt. Now, you guys weren't expecting that, were you? And the reason I know they weren't expecting it, because the riot gear these guys were wearing was impressive. Whereas the federal and state charges included murder, conspiracy to traffic and sell narcotics, illegal weapons possession, and participation in a criminal street gang. Whereas in the day of the warrant operation, the most notorious top ten of the gang were arrested on federal charges and faced anywhere from ten years to life in federal prison. Whereas another 18 from this gang were arrested on state charges and faced lengthy prison sentences. Whereas for the past year, the task force has arrested 114 gang members, recovered 51 firearms, and recovered a substantial amount of illegal narcotics. You know, that is truly incredible. The, uh, I haven't seen a gangbanger on the streets. Are you guys having trouble finding them these days? <laughs> uh, remember what it was last April? Remember all the people in the gang attire? Remember what it was like? And now we can't, we can't find a gangbanger. I mean, and the reason is, is what these folks do. So on behalf of the city of Lancaster, I have certificates for Sergeant Stephen Gross. Detective Robert Gillis, Detective Michael Thompson, Detective Edwin Berrigan, Deputy Daniel, is it Wheel? Well. Deputy Daniel Farrell. AUSA Sarah Baxter. What's that? Sorry, what? Assistant U.S. Oh, Jesus. I didn't realize that. Do you know how hard it is to be a, a, a U.S. attorney? That is, I mean, I went through all that process. They didn't even look at my application. <laughs> just, just to have them look at the application, you have to be stellar. And to actually get the job, that's really an accomplishment. And now to be taking out the gangbangers, you know, this is a heavyweight lawyer. I'm proud to meet you. Thank you. Just make sure you get them convicted. <laughs> and uh, Special Agent Jean uh, Ocamp? And you'll get that to her. Okay, great. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. If any of the family members would like to come down, you can come up to the front to take some pictures. Any family? Tell us where to stand. We'll stand there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Because I won't take it. You know, you've you've made us proud of this city. I mean, in spite of everything. And, and, I mean. We appreciate all that you've done, but what you've really done has made us proud to, to be part of this city, and we owe you an incredible debt of gratitude for that. Thank you.
Oh, they're going to do it. Okay. The Palmdale High School Health Academy's SAD program, Students Against Destructive Decisions, now have a presentation to make. Good right. evening. My name is Angela Hefter, and I'm here in support with my husband, Alan Hefter. And I've brought two students along with me from the Palmdale High School Health Careers Academy, of which I'm a teacher and a coordinator for. These students are graduating seniors, and in the academy, they're required to do a community awareness project. These three students decided to do a project of Students Against Destructive Decisions. And without going further into their presentation, which I'm going to allow them to present to you, these students also are um, excuse me, uh, affiliated with uh, Health Cures, Health Occupation Students of America, HOSA. And they competed on the state level, and these students took a gold medal with their presentation. We all also took the gold, the silver, and the bronze in our community awareness projects. This project is now going to go on and represent the state of California at the national conference in Nashville, Tennessee in June. We're very proud of these students and their efforts and their commitment, and we want to continue to support them, and we want to thank you very much for having us here. Thank you. Uh, wait a minute. How do we get you to come to Lancaster and do this in Lancaster? We support all of the community, okay. and part of that is because our students are in medical facilities throughout the Antelope Valley, and one of the purposes of doing the community awareness project is to give back to the community that supports us. So the students do participate in the internships and rotations in both the Palmdale and the Lancaster facilities, and so we wanted to show the support. And the, the message that these students are going to get out is hopefully to all the schools and throughout the community. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Katherine Chan. I'm Allison Kosh. And I'm Eric Lenorgan. And we are Students Against Destructive Decisions. SAD is an organization that works to deliver education and prevention messages to people of all ages about different types of impairment. We created our own unique... Oh no. We have a PowerPoint that goes along with our speech. That's part of the presentation. You yeah. know, it's a test to see how well you do when, I, when the technology fails. And it almost certainly will. At yes. Some point. <laughs> While that's going on, what medical facilities are you in, and how many hours a week do, are you typically involved with them? Um, I worked at Kaiser Permanente in Palmdale in the internal medicine clinic. We worked three days a week for two hours. Um, I was in Palmdale Veterinary Hospital, and during level one rotations, we rotated throughout several s facilities, um, LCH, AV Hospital, um, Kaiser, and we were all over the community. Well, I was at Lancaster Community Hospital at the wound care department. And like she said, three days a week, two hours. It's fantastic. Okay, we ready? We're gonna start the presentation over again from. All right. Um, SAD is an organization that works to deliver education and prevention messages to people of all ages about different types of impairment. We created our own unique community awareness project to inform our community about the dangers of driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs and cell phone distractions. Our goal was to reach out to our peers before they made poor decisions and to decrease the number of impaired related collisions amongst teenagers. I guess we can just go on. It's that city attorney again. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we really apologize. We've been trying to get the city to convert to Mac, but, you know, it's, it's like pulling teeth. Is that a question? I don't know how good a commercial this is for Epson.
He's going to go on about it. We're not discussing the information technology budget tonight, are we? <laughs> um, while we're waiting, uh, this group was also kind enough to do the same presentation for us at the Criminal Justice Commission and um, at a, uh, um, a presentation for our neighborhood watch block captains as well, too. Oh, I do apologize for having a problem with the projector. So. <laughs> didn't we try to get them to get a big screen television, a plasma screen? We did. We had that discussion, didn't we? Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, they just got new plasma screens at the prison. <laughs> That's just wrong. That way, this, that's why the state's going bankrupt. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So okay. here's some of the facts we uncovered in researching for this project. Drug driving doesn't usually get as much attention as drunk driving, but according to the U.S. Census Bureau, 13% of high school seniors reported driving high on marijuana, which is not at all far off from the 14% who reported driving drunk. Driver inattention is the leading cause of car collisions. The most prominent distraction a driver may face is their cell phone. A conversation held by the driver will increase their likelihood of an accident by 1.3 times. Dialing or texting on the phone will increase this chance by nearly three times. Motor vehicle crashes remain the number one cause of death to people ages 15 to 20, and 28% of these youths involved in accidents have been intoxicated. Teenagers tend to have an attitude of invincibility to many dangers, such as impaired driving. We see people texting and talking on the phone every day and hear of accidents caused by driving impaired on the news nationwide. Since prom and graduation were coming up, we wanted to spread the importance of these issues to our peers before they were faced with a choice to partake in destructive decisions. Unfortunately, we have real examples of what a terrible impact these kinds of decisions can have on people's lives. On September 12, 2008, Jacob Hepter's life was taken in the Chatsworth Metrolink crash. Jacob was an outstanding HOSA member and presented the Every 15 Minutes project last year against drunk driving. Johanna Lobos was a member of our Health Cares Academy and HOSA chapter. She was an outstanding volunteer, but most of all, she was my good friend. On September 23, 2008, she was just using the crosswalk when she was struck and killed by a drunk driver. That driver's irresponsible decision took my friend's life, and we were determined to do everything in our power to ensure no one we had the power to reach would make the same kind of bad decision that took our friend's lives. Uh, this project required a lot of organization and planning. The first step was to obtain a sponsorship, which we did from the Arts Paris Law Firm. We then needed to gather a wide range of materials, which was a large undertaking in itself. When we finally did gather everything necessary to prove our point, we went through a lot of experimentation, trial and error, to make sure our activity would go just right. We then created surveys with meaningful questions, and distributed them, and created a high-impact PowerPoint presentation. Long before our assembly, we began researching and drafting a survey to gauge our peers' choices and knowledge of driving decisions. Then two days prior to our, our event, with the help of our chapter, we distributed and collected the survey to use in our presentation. On January 30, 2009, we presented our SAB project to 450 of our fellow students from freshmen to seniors. Thanks to our Paris Law Firm, through our educational pamphlets, awarding of t-shirts for correct answers to questions, and memento keychains, we were successful in promoting our HOSA chapter. On the back of our pamphlet, there was a pledge with which students could promise to themselves to avoid destructive decisions, which to our surprise, students committed to, signed, and returned to us without us asking it of them. During our assembly, we utilized the PowerPoint we created not just to say, oh, this is bad, don't do it, but to really educate our audience on the physiological effects of intoxicants and phone distraction. As an addendum to the alcohol and drunk driving segment, we showed the Every 15 Minutes video produced by Jacob Hefter, which helped to drive home our point not only by its own sobering content, but by the fact that we could point out how its creator had his life snuffed out by destructive decisions. Our hands-on activity demonstration consisted of volunteers mounting on tricycles and riding on a simple course. Some wore impairment goggles, some texted on their cell phones, and some were unimpaired. 
With this activity, we were able to show that the slight loss of motor skills caused by the impairment goggles and cell phone distractions caused our volunteers to veer out of their lanes, ignore signals, and to have collisions with other tricycles and pedestrians. Through this demonstration, we were able to show the audience the bigger picture, that if the tricycles were too difficult, difficult to control while being impaired or distracted, getting behind the wheel of a two-ton motor vehicle under such conditions was out of the question. We had three guest speakers, Mike Michoni and Doug Sweeney, who are former California Highway Patrol officers. They shared their experience of tragedies concerning impaired driving. Our third guest speaker, Dr. Hadavudi, an EMS doctor, spoke about the success you can meet with in life when you do not make destructive decisions. We arranged media coverage of our event with our local newspaper and television news. And now we'd like to show you our television news coverage. Mrs. Hefner, you're hey, a group of to Palmdale High signature. students, with the help of their teacher, took a stand against destructive behavior, and 450 of their peers listened. SoCal News reports. It's very difficult because it's been just a short time that our son has passed away, and it, feeling of this is very powerful. Angela Hefter and her husband looked on through tears at some of the 12th graders Mrs. Hefter teaches. These seniors warn fellow students about destructive decisions. It only takes, you know, a split second for you to make a bad decision, whether it's texting and driving or, you know, picking up your phone while you're driving or drinking and getting in the car impaired, and that could ruin somebody's life. The Hafters know this lesson all too well. Their teenage son Jacob was one of 25 people killed in a Chapsworth Metrolink crash September 12, 2008. The engineer was reportedly text messaging when he ran a red light. The decision of that engineer took Jacob's life. Jacob went to school with these teens and was in the same health care academy program. That affected me personally and I think it affected everyone in the academy. Along with another student, Johanny Lobos, who was killed only a few weeks after Jacob. All Johanny was doing was using the crosswalk and somebody hit her and drove off who was drunk. Now eight seniors are using these tragedies to make a point. Think about the consequences before you do something like that. Through speeches and exercises. Students attending the assembly walked and rode around on tricycles with impairment goggles to demonstrate the dangers of drunk driving. And even though it is difficult and personal, the Hefters say they don't mind being an advocate for this cause. If we can do one thing to save somebody's life, then that's what our goal is. Jacob Hefter was an organizer of the Every 15 Minutes demonstration against drunk driving when he was at Palmdale High. Students in Hefter's family say they consider today's program part of his legacy. Some definite cons we faced while we organized this event was that it was still a delicate matter to address. We had major technical issues concerning different Microsoft versions and formatting the video interview to work correctly on PowerPoint. We had to deal with few teens who felt they were virtually invincible and had really stubborn attitudes towards the subject. We had one sad coordinator who could not attend the HOSA conference. <coughs> And we also needed to deal with the pressure of being a senior with our futures in mind. We felt our project really succeeded in bringing the community together to make a positive impact. We were able to create uh, an original creative presentation that, was, that informed our audience and was a learning experience for us as well. Because of the events we described before, we had tremendous support from our Health Careers Academy and HOSA chapter. They really helped us draw something positive from terrible tragedy and carry on our friend's legacy of inspiration and education. We're in the process of producing a video from our presentation, which we're going to distribute throughout the wider community to spread our message of responsibility. Um, one time during the, our presentation that we felt we had changed perspectives was during our, our open forum. One girl mentioned how her parents had warned her it was unsafe to text and drive, and she had ignored them. But after participating in our assembly, she was determined to make better choices in the future. Thank you. Any questions? When your video is done, Councilman Cilio had a wonderful idea. We could put it on the city uh, station channel. Uh, so as soon as it's done, get it to us and we'll put it on the air. Okay. 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 Great. That's wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd all 
also like to add that this morning Palmdale High School had their senior assembly and there was over 500 graduating seniors there and they presented the same presentation along with the every 15 minute video that was presented by our son. It was um, for a gymnasium full of 500 seniors. It was that you could hear a pin drop and the message really came across from the staff. I was unable to be there, but the staff came out and said that the students, a lot of them were in tears and just said, you know, just seeing that, we're trying to promote sober graduation, we're pr trying to promote positive things of their life. Some of these students still said it made an impact to them. So I'm, we're very proud of these students. We think that they're gonna go on to the national level and they're gonna do a f phenomenally good job in sending the message. So we again, wanna thank you for all your time. Thank you. Thank you. And Mrs. Hefner, thank you. It, it, most people we see that have faced what you faced are overwhelmed by it and for you to to you're literally making incredible changes and it takes incredible courage to to face that every day and we we thank you for it okay thank you very much sure we'll see about getting you an apple <laughs> all their their batteries do go dead have you noticed that my, my, I'm always buying the kids new batteries. Okay, moving on. All speaker cards must be filled out and submitted prior to the agenda item being called. This same rule applies if you wish to speak on a non-agendaized agendaized item at the end of the meeting. Following this process will allow us to conduct a timely and orderly meeting. Thank you. Okay, going to the consent agency consent calendar, is there anything that needs to be pulled? Uh, Mr. Mayor, at this time, if we could, um, I'd like to move that we uh, continue PH1 till August 25th. Was, this was at the request of the appellant because we do have one speaker card and I'd hate to see them wait until that moment. That would be uh, public hearing number one. It's an oh. appeal. Oh, over oh, here though. Yeah. We're, okay. yeah. I, just, I just thought yeah, we should. We're gonna, we're gonna take that off. Just so you all know. I, I move that we uh, continue it to August 25th. I second that. Okay. All in favor? And there was a card to Nancy know? Schmidt that wanted to speak on that, so she's still here. She could. August 25th, ma'am. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve the agency consent calendar? Move that we uh, approve the agency consent calendar. I'll second that. Okay. Let's vote. It's, un it's unanimous. Uh, I want to remove uh, council consent calendar item number 13. Also, if we can move uh, CC5, we have a speaker card on that one. Uh, at request, we remove item number four as well, just for separate consideration. Okay, so we're going to remove item 4, 5, and 13. 13. On the remaining items, is there a motion? I move that we uh, adopt the consent calendar as currently comprised. Is there a second? I'll second that. Let's vote. Mine's stuck. And it's unanimous. Going on to CC4. Just to be consistent with previous votes. I'm sorry, what? Just to be consistent with previous votes. I'll move that we adopt CC4. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll second that. <laughs> okay. And it's three to two. Uh, CC5. One speaker card, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Cleo Goss. This was a surprise. I had no idea this was going to be on the agenda. So I've just got a few thoughts. Rezoning an established residential neighborhood is not only overturning a previous council decision, but it's breaking a promise to homeowners who paid more for their homes based on this desirable location. Both overturning previous council decisions and breaking promises are items that the mayor has specifically brought up as two reasons why not to change Gilly Park's name. In, this, in, in a May 19th AV Press article, it is reported that the Planning Commission has recommended rezoning 96 acres of residential property to commercial. 
This is short by only four acres of two of the three proposed projects on 60th Street West. This recommendation came out only a week after the final EIR was brought up before the Commission. Hardly any enough time to digest such a large document. The second project addressed in this article, the Super Target, hasn't even completed its final EIR yet. The Commission has given a recommendation to rezone it. This just highlights how little time the Commission spends on reading the EIR. If they can jump the gun and recommend a zone change for a project that hasn't even completed its EIR. All of the reasons given for the project that, uh, for the zone change given by supposed supporter residents in favor of the project are flawed. Some were paid off with fi uh, free meals by the public relations company representing the project. Others were likely only renters, not homeowners. The Mayflower Retirement Community Driver spoke upon saving gas and reducing air pollution this project would bring to the Mayflower residents by shopping on Decay and 60th Street. These elderly residents do not maintain the residential apartments in Mayflower Gardens and would have little need to shop at a building and garden center like Lowe's. There already exists two pharmacies that are local closer to this Mayflower retirement community with a third one being built as we speak. Finally, we have the public relations representative who brought his whole family to speak for the project. I know this man lives at least three miles away, so he will not be affected by this project. And he already lives closer to existing Lowe's, car wash, McDonald's, and gas station. If you remove the renters, the Mayflower Gardens driver, the public relations family, and the people paid off with residential meals, then the number of speakers against this project far outnumber the speakers for the project. Thank you. Any other speaker cards? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor. I'll move that we adopt CC5. Oh, then we have to close the public hearing? It's public hearing. Oh, it's not a public hearing. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second that. Let's vote. It's unanimous. On uh, consent calendar item number 13, I have to recuse myself. It involves the low tree area where I, my wife has uh, an ownership interest. Let the record reflect that the mayor's uh, left the room and I've taken over the chair. Uh, do I hear any motions on CC 13? Move adoption CC 13. Do I hear a second? I'll second that. Call for a vote. It's unanimous with uh, Mayor Paris recusing himself. Let the record reflect that I've turned the chair back over to the mayor. Thank you. the uh, public hearing the previous CPH 1 news rack ordinance this public hearing was opened at a previous meeting and continued to this date we will now hear the staff report from Monique Edwards the management analyst for the finance department good evening mayor council members I'm before you tonight in regards to the introduction of ordinance number 918 and the adoption of resolution number 09-26. The intent of this ordinance is to establish a comprehensive set of regulations in regards to news racks. The purpose is to advance and improve safety and aesthetics by controlling the number, size, construction, placement, and appearance of news racks without restricting the free dispersal of information as guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States and the State of California. When going through the process of um, considering changes to this ordinance, we have met with various members of the news media and the real estate board, and we have determined that there is no adverse harm being done to anyone. There, the per One of the other purposes is to ensure that there's no overpopulation of news racks in a particular area to ensure that all placements of news racks meet the ADA requirements that 
light um, street lights and fixtures can be placed in the appropriate locations without news racks impeding the area and that the news racks can withstand various weather conditions so it is staff's recommendation that you you approve the introduction of the ordinance and that you also adopt the resolution as being presented if you have any questions I'd be glad to answer them for you any questions okay you got off the hook <laughs> thank you very much You're welcome. Okay. any speaker cards uh, no sir mayor mr. mayor any communications no sir let's close the public hearing and any discussion I move that we adopt ordinance number 918 second that let's vote I'm sorry what I'm sorry yeah I misspoke introduce 918 right okay. it's unanimous I'll move that we adopt resolution number 09-26 I'll second that so, again it's unanimous public hearing item number one has been moved let's open the public hearing on PH2 and we'll hear a staff report from the planning director Brian Ludicky oh the cargo container one again that always generated some good mail mayor Paris and members of the City Council uh, back in February you as City Council introduced this ordinance uh, at that time that ordinance did not contain within it provisions to allow uh, on a permanent basis the use of cargo containers within the industrial zones of the city um, in response to a number of comments that were received uh, back in March uh, the council directed that staff take a look at revising this ordinance to include some provisions within it that would in fact allow the use of these uh, containers in the industrial zones of the city uh, we have brought back to you an ordinance which does that um, as we've indicated to you it would modify the the ordinance that you previously looked at uh, to allow these uh, containers within industrial zones subject to certain restrictions those restrictions would include a requirement that they meet the same setback requirements that a main building would would have to meet within the zone uh, there are also restrictions on using them uh, in such a way that would impair access block required parking uh, create some kind of other uh, health or safety problem uh, further they could not be used for human habitation or for the storage of refuse or dangerous materials um, we believe that this does in fact address the issues that were uh, raised by the public and were directed uh, and we were directed by you as a council to address um, we are recommending to you that you reintroduce this ordinance as it's been amended uh, I would call to your attention also one additional item uh, which was missed uh, when we when we brought this forth to you um, when this when the Planning Commission initially reviewed this ordinance and made a recommendation to you uh, in January they modified one of the uh, proposed requirements as it addresses the or allows these within the rural residential zones um, they modified that in their recommendation to a setback distance from property lines of 50 feet uh, the current ordinance that you have in front of you still registers as hundred feet uh, we would recommend that you make that change also to 50 feet as originally uh, proposed by the Planning Commission and was in fact in the ordinance copy that you saw uh, last February I'd be happy to answer any questions for you that you may have you see the thing on television about how they were using these for housing I mean they were nice houses I'm serious it was it was an amazing show I you know I'm sure I'm sure with the proper yeah. with the proper work you can make it look wonderful along with the penguin house well it was a house I mean better than what I grew up in I mean. <laughs> however in in our discussions with the with the building official there are some some building code issues in, in using them in that way so just a thought mr. Luke are all the changes that you talked about with the Planning Commission and staff that they're in the ordinance now that 
With the exception, right, with the exception of the, the 50 foot distance instead of the 100. Wait, we had all that mail, we got no speaker cards? No, so, so we're, tr we're supposed to add the 50 foot, uh, you want us to add the 50 foot distance? Yes, actually it would be a, a change to uh, section 17.08.050A uh, sub 3B4. <laughs> which currently reads as 100 and should read as 50. So that would be the change as recommended by Mr. Ludicky. <laughs> <laughs> well, for a motion? thank you very much, Mr. Ludicky. Thank you. Uh, I'll get you that video on the houses. Mayor Paris, I'd just like to um, reiterate the reason that I brought this forth was um, for the purpose that these cargo containers don't sit in the front yards or the driveways of people in residential areas. Um, it wasn't to um, make life hard for anybody. We did, um, after the initial ordinance came out, um, we did listen to the citizens and we revised it in the industrial zones. And I think it's a good ordinance. And I appreciate the work that uh, Mr. Ludicky and staff have done on it. I, I agree with you. I think it's a good ordinance, too. But, you know, you remind me of my wife. She made me take the couch out of the front yard. <laughs> and you can't put a TV on your, your screen-in porch, either. What? what? Well, wait just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Okay. Well, that being the case, are those amendments to it, too? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll move that we adopt ordinance number 921 with the amendment to section 17.08.050, section A sub 3 sub B sub 4, from 100 feet to 50 feet. I'll second, second that. It's an introduction. Introduction. Yes, thank you. Reintroduce. And it's unanimous. New business. We'll now hear the staff report for item number NB1 from Public Works Director Randy Williams. Oh, this is, if you guys pay attention to this, this is really cool. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, on occasions like this, I'm always prone to speak overly energetic, so I'm going to try to control myself. To no, this, this, no, thing. this is really... But I, I, I do have a couple things I'd like to say. Approximately 20 months ago, we began to get to know an individual by the name of Wayne Stevens. And he was working with us and a number of other people for the uh, eSolar project, which soon will be opening its, uh, its operation of the first solar facility in the, the Antelope Valley that I'm aware of. It's a really exciting project. And then Wayne had impressed us so much that I believe it was in March at the uh, board, annual Board of Trade Business Outlook Conference. He was featured as our primary speaker on that particular occasion because of all of the good works that was ongoing at the time with eSolar, which were moving very quickly and certainly to the benefit of the community. There were some changes that were made in the, um, in the business pro forma, if you will, of eSolar. And uh, it seemed like all of a sudden, Wayne was on my doorstep asking to discuss some other great ideas that he had developed in the course of some changes taking place. I, I can only say to you that occasionally there are ideas that come before you that are just so brilliant that you can't turn them down. You, you can't turn the person away. So for about the last two and a half months or so, Mr. Stevens and uh, Robert Neal, our building official, uh, several other people in, in the city staff, uh, including the city manager's office and myself, have had a number of discussions to try to further bring along the idea that uh, he was presenting to us. I'm not going to share any of the idea. I'm going to leave that entirely to him today. But I do want to say that what we're proposing to you this evening is that you agree to adopt a memorandum of understanding that will allow the city staff and Mr. Stevens and others from Daystar Farms to develop further the, the concept, the ideas, the vision of this idea, and likewise to bring them to fruition in the city of Lancaster. This is just a first step. It's a non-committal step, but it does pave the way for us to develop more detailed agreements in the future as to how different aspects of the proposal will work. 
With that, let me turn it over to Mr. Stevens. He's got some exciting things to share with the council. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Williams. I remember you. You're the guy that I introduced as one of the smartest people I'd ever met. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the guy. And I told you it was supposed to be the most handsome man you've ever met. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Mr. Mayor and council members, my name is Wayne Stevens, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to tell you about Daystar Farms and how we want to work with the city of Lancaster to make this community the focus of solar power generation, not only of California and the United States, but of the world. We develop solar parks, and a solar park is not a recreational facility that's powered by the sun, but it's more like a business park where businesses come and um, set up facilities to do business. In this case, the business is solar power generation. A solar park is a piece of property that's been laid out and developed so that solar companies can build solar power plants. And any solar company is welcome to come. It doesn't matter what the technology is, if it's a large solar plant or a small experimental plant. Any size, any technology. Um, our group was uh, created, we're a small group, a new group. Um, Although as individuals we have substantial experience working with the city of Lancaster, primarily in the permitting and development of eSolar's plant on Avenue G. Uh, we also have experience in other developments in the Antelope Valley. Um, our folks have experience in the solar industry in permitting, in development of projects, in technology development, and in dealing with utilities. We plan to develop more than one large solar project, power our solar park in the Antelope Valley. Um, the site is yet to be determined, but we're hoping by the middle of this summer we'll be able to announce some plans. Um, our first project is will be in or near the city of Lancaster, appro approximately 1,000 megawatts or one gigawatt. And just as a matter of reference, one gigawatt of output can uh, meet the electrical demands of approximately 800,000 homes. There's a lot of great reasons to do this project, but I listed just five here. There's a big demand for solar energy, both from the public and from the government. Um, whether you believe in man-made global warming or call yourself an environmentalist or not, I think most people will agree that it's just plain wasteful to be burning fossil fuels when you can generate electricity from the sun if it makes economic sense. As far as the government's concerned, the state of California has mandated 20% renewable energy by the year 2010, a uh, goal that will not be met, and 33% renewable energy by the year 2020. Now there's many solar companies that are attempting to build solar power plants in the state of California. In fact, there's over 50 uh, projects representing close to 25 gigawatts of power that are already in the uh, California Independent System Operator uh, interconnection queue. These, uh, these are projects uh, represented, uh, that represent over 20 different solar companies. Now all these projects are facing, basically are floundering in the, um, in the permitting process. And in fact, I would, I would uh, beg to say that most of these projects will actually never be built. Now let me give you a few, a few examples. There's a company by the name of BrightSource, a very good company that is attempting to build a large amount of generation out near the Nevada border in the Mojave Desert. They're having all sorts of permitting issues, basically for a variety of reasons, one of, the, one of which is the uh, uh, desert tortoise. But recently, Senator Feinstein has come out with a plan to take approximately a million acres of what she calls pristine desert and turn it into a national monument. Many uh, solar companies are in this particular area of that she plans to make the national monument in, including this company, BrightSource. There's another project on the Carrizo Plains near San Luis Obispo, uh, approximately 500 megawatts, that is basically dead in the water because of permitting issues. Um, there's um, uh, basically environmental issues. The Energy Commission has recommended that there be five to one land mitigation, which makes the projects totally economically unfeasible. And the environmentalists are all up in arms that there's a, um, 
desert kit fox that's in the area that migrates through the area. So basically, it's there's a lot of companies that want to build in California, but it's near impossible to actually get anything built, even though everyone wants it. The people want it, the government want it, the utilities want it, and the companies want to build it. So that's where Daystar Farms come in. Um, what the industry needs is a place where they can come and build solar power plants in a place that's been already permitted, that makes the, makes the environmentalists, make the permitting uh, entities and agencies happy. And if you're going to do that someplace, if you had the entire world to pick to do that, the natural place to do that is the Antelope Valley. Basically, it has all, almost all the ingredients already. It has great solar resource. It has flat, disturbed land that's, that's perfect for um, building solar power plants. It's close to load centers. These projects way out in the middle of the Mojave Desert, even if they get permitting for the power plant, they still have to get permitting for hundreds of miles of transmission lines. Whereas in the Antelope Valley, you're, you have, first of all, you have Palmdale and Lancaster here, but you're also really close to one of the largest uh, load centers, LA Basin, in the, in the entire world. Also, you have basically community support that's in favor of these projects here. Now, what you're missing here is a large parcel of land with some sort of blanket permitting that's ready, that's basically ready to go for the energy, for the solar companies. And you're also going to need some upgrading of the uh, transmission lines here. So there's lots of benefits to the local community. Basically, there's jobs at the solar park. There are basically um, construction jobs and assembly jobs. But as in the case of eSolar, once you start to build out here, it makes sense to relocate some of your facilities out here. eSolar, for example, has engineer and manufacturing facilities in the city of Palmdale. So besides jobs at the solar park, these solar companies who build out here will be bringing their engineering and manufacturing facilities. And all of a sudden, you start getting a, uh, re reaching a critical mass of talent in the, in the talent pool in the, in the city. So this becomes the place to build solar, solar power plants. So more and more companies want to come here. And eventually, the goal is to have this become the Silicon Valley of the solar industry. Um, and along with these companies come increased tax, base, tax bases. Uh, Daystar Farms plans to do profit sharing from these solar parks with the city. Um, we plan to work with the city, whether this first particular park is within the city limits or just outside the city limits. We plan to work with city staff to do master planning to make sure that this solar park uh, meets the needs and desires of the local community. And it also fulfills a vision that um, I and other people have had for the Antelope Valley and the city of Long Lancaster for quite some time now to make this the solar capital of the world. And what we're proposing today is to uh, enter into a non-binding memorandum of understanding to further explore ways to work together. But the basic notion of what we want to do is uh, enter into a joint venture with the city where Daystar Farms pays for the development and the, and, uh, of the project, the permitting of the project, and any upgrades to um, the transmission lines. Uh, we will want to get the, the solar park into a ready state for the solar companies to come and build. Daystar Farms will take the lead in the advocacy of all this permitting. Uh, we'll recruit the tenants to come to the park and we'll own and operate the park. What we are asking from the city of Lancaster is no funding whatsoever. Uh, basically, we are looking to you for leadership in what I've been calling this advocacy plan or putting together the coalition of political stakeholders and community stakeholders to make this happen. Um, we're looking for support in uh, building up the transmission, perhaps looking at uh, uh, applying for uh, federal stimulus money to make this a part of the smart grid. And we're also looking to, to your city staff for the expertise in working with all the other regional and state uh, agencies that we need to deal with and to make this a reality. Next steps, again, we're looking for city council approval of a non-binding memorandum of understanding, at which point we'll be off and running doing uh, permitting, looking at the transmission and, and working to get site control. Um, then we'll be working with the city staff to put the, put the plan together to bring to uh, the other cities in the area, the county, 
the, and the state and even the federal government to make this a reality. I've talked to a lot of people about this particular idea, this project, and they've all said, they've all had the exact same reaction. I said, this is a great idea. Why hasn't someone done this before? And we've all racked our brains why someone hasn't done it before, because it's such a good idea. The only thing we could come up with is that it takes a tremendous amount of work and actually a lot of money from our investors to make this happen before we even know if uh, the solar companies will participate in it. But I've been in the solar industry long enough and I've dealt with all these permitting agencies long enough that I am quite confident that this is the right thing to do and, and once we build it, it will be filled up right away and we work, we'll be working on our next solar park. I'd be happy to answer any questions from the council now or um, after the meeting, I can answer questions from the council or anyone who's here tonight. Any questions? Any questions? Any comments? Uh, let me get this straight. A, a solar park that would produce 1,000 megawatt, a gigawatt of power would make the Antelope Valley a net exporter of energy? That's correct. During the, during the peak times, the peak hours of production, it would export power down to the LA Basin. What I've heard tonight is that you're putting together a team that is experienced, has capital, and is, uh, knows the solar power industry and wants to uh, break down all of the points where other companies are hung up or have failed at bringing their project to fruition. And what you're asking us to do is to do what we do best, which is make sure the community is involved and that as stakeholders they're represented and that we deal with bureaucracies. And it's sad to say, but local government becomes an expert in bureaucracy because we deal with it at every level, the county, the state, and the feds. Is that a fair statement? I think that's a fair statement. I think the, our philosophy is why have every solar company with every project they propose beat their heads against the wall and get involved in this time-consuming, painful process where I'll go beat my head against the wall and, and just do it once for the entire industry. And, and so far, it doesn't cost us any money yet. That's a, kind of a good part. <laughs> Anyone else? The positive that I can also see besides being a net exporter, um, is the jobs that it'll bring. Because I think <clears throat> just listening to the presentation, I, I'm, I'm enthralled with what you actually said, that other businesses will relocate here and we could be building solar panels and offices may be located here and uh, I just see it as a win-win. Yeah, if you just look at just the construction jobs only, uh, when I was at East Solar, we, had a, we peaked out I think at about 170 uh, people working at the site over on Avenue G and the philosophy here would be that when companies express interest um, they star farms will uh, Strongly advocate them that they have a strong presence in the in the local community not just construct here And it makes sense. I mean, that's why e solar has a facility in Palmdale because it makes sense to be close to doing your projects It's great. I don't know that we were ever really happy with that <laughs> 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 For what it's worth. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, we have one speaker card that's late. Be, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. It's late. The problem with late speaker cards is we have a rule. We, we can't break it. If we break it, then somebody sues us because we didn't break it for them, and those lawyers. Anyway, uh, the, uh, I, I had a conversation a couple months ago with, with somebody out of Los Angeles and they were talking about another thing that city staff was doing. And they said every now and then an idea comes along that's truly inspired. This is one of those ideas. It, it is truly inspired. Uh, there, there's a couple things I would like the staff to work with you on. This should be an Antelope Valley issue. It should not just be a Lancaster issue because the reality is is it's the Antelope Valley that has the best sun in the world uh, for all the reasons you said. I mean this is the logical place. So uh, this would be one of those things we really need to meet with, with the county and the city of Palmdale and see if they want to get involved with this. Perhaps do a joint uh, powers agreement or something to, where we can 
jointly expand this. Uh, this really is going to be the future of the Antelope Valley. There, there, I don't see anything else on the horizon that rivals this. The, this is, uh, I've said it over and over, this is it's truly something magnificent that you, you've brought to us. Um, the other thing is, is I want to make certain that the Lancaster University, the engineering university, gets deeply involved in this quickly because it's just a natural fit. Uh, so that we have the labor force to, to meet these needs. And uh, I'm excited. I hope everybody else is. I'm excited, too. The only caveat I, I want to say is this won't happen overnight. It's going to take a couple years before we can uh, we'll get, get the ribbon. That. Yeah, we get that. But we're going to ease solar lights next month, doesn't it? I mean, e-solar e is actually going to produce power in an economically uh, feasible and profitable way. And, and I think that's the first in the country that's doing that. It actually makes a profit on it. Am I correct? Uh, I can't speak to other other companies' profit or loss, but uh, that's that's the goal of e-solar, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good goal for companies. I'm <laughs> <laughs> also pretty sure okay. the sun will still be shining in two or three years as well. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion to approve? I'll move that we approve the MOU with Daystar Farms. I'll second it. And it's unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very Stevens. much. With your support, I'll make it happen. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Council agenda none. City manager, any announcements? No, sir. City clerk, any announcements? Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the time uh, to address the city council on any items that are not on the agenda. You'll find speaker cards at the back of the council chambers. You would need to fill those out right now. Um, additionally, we, re we request that you fill the cards out very clearly and concisely so that we can read your writing and get in touch with you if necessary. And staff will be able to get in touch with you as well. Individual speakers are allowed three minutes. When you approach the podium, please notice there are three lights. The green light comes on when your time begins. The yellow light comes on when you have 30 seconds left and the red light comes on when your time is up. We ask that you be considerate of your allotted time to allow other speakers to have their three minutes as well. Following this procedure will allow for a smooth and timely process for the city council meeting, and we appreciate your cooperation. State law does prohibit the city council from taking action on items not on the agenda, and your matter will be referred to the city manager. We'd also like to mention that uh, there's no need to touch the microphones when you come up. They're very sensitive, so they will pick up your voice if you speak uh, nice and loud. And um, with that, we're ready for the first speaker. Thank you. Yeah. Twelve cards, Mr. Mayor. David Paul, I thought I'd have you first this time. Actually, Ron thought he'd have you first this time. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council, good evening. I saw a lot of wonderful things here tonight. It's the reason I come and I thank you. I uh, found this thought from the day in the paper. It says, life is a tragedy full of joy. I think the tragedy is most people don't know the wonder and joy that life allows. And that's why I talk about the love of the law. Uh, Councilwoman Marcus, I'm so glad to see you back. I've been sitting on some Cicero for a while. Uh, I appreciated you uh, bringing him up. And I wanted to call and raise you one, but this is just the raise. True law is right reason in agreement with nature. The task of justice is therefore to discover the nature of things in a given situation rather than impose upon it preconceived solutions supplied either by relevatory insights or logical deductions. Now, I've mentioned before the organization LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, and this is one of the things that is on one of these sites. It says, it's a quote from Einstein, and it's his first impression of the United States from 1921. It says, the prestige of government has undoubtedly been lowered considerably by the prohibition law, for nothing is more destructive of respect for the government and the law of the land than passing laws which cannot be enforced. It is an open secret that the dangerous increase in crime in this country is closely connected with this. 
So we get back to this situation. My heart grieved when I saw the presentation by those children about people dying from distracted drivers, drunk drivers, impaired drivers, and that's what the Human Accountability Project technical part was about. We have the technological possibility today to prevent a single drunk driver from getting behind the wheel. And so I see the problems even trying to bring a sensible solution like solar energy. Uh, how could we get past this people's right to think that it's an infringement to impose any restrictions on their driving? Uh, so that's a tough one. I, I realize that. But I guess what I'm trying to really say is that and this is from the Human Accountability Project. For most of us, the greatest joy of the human experience comes from the connection we feel when we care about others. And that incident on TV last week with the uh, rollover of that van after the guy almost ran down the officer trying to throw the spike strip. See, there shouldn't be an officer out there trying to throw a spike strip. We should be able to shut up a car like that from a satellite. And the benefits to society from having that fair and consistent thing in traffic overrides any limits that people perceive would be put upon them. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, two ago, I was ecstatic for about three hours when the uh, Transportation Secretary, Ray LaHood, announced that they would use the GPS uh, trackers in cars currently to log the miles and, and, and have the uh, mileage tax. And then the, three hours later, they came out with a correction on that. But, you know, I, I just want us to understand that we have it within our power to bring people in. And uh, I guess what I'm going to wait for is uh, other speakers to see what they say. But uh, I did find a double-blind study for uh, medical marijuana online. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I just want safe access for these people that need it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Richard Hecker. Mayor Paris, for the last year to last year and a half, I've come to many of these council meetings for various reasons. Sometimes I speak, like tonight, sometimes I don't. But tonight, I came specifically because I wanted to say thank you, Mayor Paris. At the last council meeting, during the council agenda discussion, you explained why you felt it was wrong for the city to give something to someone and then to take it away. And of course, I'm talking about the discussion on naming the city parks. I agree. It is wrong for Lancaster to make a commitment and then to later arbitrarily rescind it. Promises should not be broken. This is a principle that should not be taken lightly. At the last meeting, I chose to speak about the general plan. I explained how that's like a road map. That's something that a citizen can look to. It can tell them what to expect in the future from Lancaster. And that's a commitment I hope that the city of Lancaster does not take lightly. So I wanted to come here and say thank you for explaining your view on that and to tell you that I agree it is wrong for the city of Lancaster to make a commitment and then arbitrarily rescind it. Good night. Thank you. Carl Sundstrom. I'll try to get through this as fast as I can. I had a heart transplant a couple of months ago, so I'm a little shaky. but. In any event, um, I've seen the ads on the uh, television of the mayors of Palmdale and Lancaster regarding buying their new cars here in the valley and keeping sales tax here in the valley. I wanted to say a couple of things about that. I went to a dealership in Lancaster Auto Mall 
looked at an automobile that was bought from out of state at a, uh, um, a wholesale buy, found out who owned it, the lease company that owned it, and they put it up for uh, wholesale after they got the car back. Found out exactly what the dealer paid for it, offered the dealer $1,000 over what they paid for it, and asked them for a Carfax. When I went into the dealership, they showed me what they said was a Carfax, but it wasn't. It was some kind of a generic type thing. And they also would not deal on the car at all. They didn't ask for any kind of offers, nothing. They simply came out and said, this is what we want for the car, period, thank you, goodbye. Went to another dealership in the same place. It faces 10th Street West yesterday. Found an automobile there that had no license plates on it. And I just assumed that the automobile probably came from out of state or was bought wholesale. The dealer refused to tell me that. I asked for a Carfax. They said they would give me one. And I went into the car dealer, the guy fiddled around for a short time, came back later and said, we give out a Carfax at the time of purchase. So what does that tell you? Then I went to Pondale, went to another dealer that sold the same kind of car, looked for a 2008 new vehicle, found out they had five of them. And all five of them had dealer add-ons that were priced at ridiculous prices, like $348 for a window etching, which you can get done anywhere for $30 to $50, $200 for spraying a fabric protector on the seats, $400 for a, what's considered a wax job, and most of them were about $1,500 add-ons. Now, I understand why they do this, so they can make more money. But the problem is, is that there's a handful of dealers out here who treat us like we're morons. They feel that we don't know anything. And as long as they continue to do so and remain as arrogant as a lot of them are, people are going to continue to go down below to buy their vehicles because they can save thousands of dollars. There are dealerships on every other corner down there, and they're willing to deal with you and negotiate with you where they're not here in the valley. And I think that somebody here needs to educate these automobile dealers out here so they stop whining and crying about people going down below and buying their vehicles when they are the people that cause the problem by treating us like we're morons. Thank you. Thank you. I'm astonished how well you're doing after the heart transplant. You're, that's wonderful. And, didn't, and it didn't take any of your uh, passion for life out away from you at all, did it? Good. Thank you. Uh, Cleo Goss. At the last council meeting trying to justify rezoning a residential neighborhood adjacent to 60th Street West and Avenue K to commercial, 60th Street was called a major north-south corridor. How can a 15-mile double-ended dead-end road be considered a north-south corridor? This street should be called a road segment, not a corridor. From Roseman Boulevard, where the southern half begins, to Avenue I, this 11-mile piece is a single-lane road, and it returns to a single-lane road at L8, to its northern endpoint at Avenue N for another, or another one and a half miles. The only portion of this north-south corridor road is the three-mile segment between Avenue I and, and starting at the prison and ending at Quartz Hill High School on Avenue L. The number of lanes in this three-mile piece is not consistent in both directions, and at multiple places it is only widened for a tenth of a mile before it collapses back down to a single lane. It resembles a lumpy piece of taffy with thick and thin portions spread at random. Claiming this road is the logical choice to place commercial establishments because it is a major north-south corridor doesn't hold water. This supposed north-south corridor has little traffic except for that three-mile stretch between the prison and the high school used by local residents, commuting prison workers, and school traffic for both the high school and the junior high school. The only part that has traffic signals instead of stop signs is the same three-mile segment between the prison and the schools. Turning 60th Street West into a commercial artery will not work unless the whole three-mile segment is widened consistently to double lanes. Otherwise, commuters trying to re return home will bypass this street 
to avoid the traffic and take 50th Street instead, passing right through Quartz Hill Business District with all its comparable shopping. Since this location is five miles from the freeway, it is only convenient for local residents. If the stores would like to have these customers, they will have to make access to them less frustrating. Increasing the number of traffic signals on this three-mile segment will only aggravate residential commuters unless the signals are coordinated to allow traffic to flow instead of stop at every driveway to the commercial center. The developers will have to straighten out the laffy lump, taffy lumps of 60th Street West as well as widen the routes from the freeway so everyone will avoid the so, so that everyone will not avoid the area as the delivery trucks clog the local roadways. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bozigian, would you make certain that the clip of Mr. Sundstrom's uh, presentation make it to the owners of all the dealerships in the Lancaster Mall? Thank you. Uh, Okay, I have a group of cards here from the marijuana, medical marijuana group, is that right? Uh, I can just start calling you or you can organize yourself and tell me how you want to do it. Or you may want to have two or three speakers speak for all of you. Um, We're going to all speak, but I'd like to go first if that's okay. Sure, come on up. I'm sorry, I forgot you. You're Melanie, right? Victoria. Victoria, that's right. Melanie. Good evening, Mayor Paris and fellow council members. Welcome back. Good evening. Thank you. Um, again, we come back for the same question of concern in regards to safe access. Um, Mr. Cilio, again, you know, we have that information in regards to that. But again, the question here is in regards to what we believe in. I have a couple of questions. Does anybody know the difference of the council members and the mayor, the difference between an indica and a sativa? Do you know what a THC Receptor cell means. You, 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 Victoria? I'm, in a, I'm getting somewhere with this. Please, okay. just allow me my three minutes. Okay, sure. Do you know what CBD means? These are the scientific research and significance that they found in medical marijuana and what's basically going on. You know, Mr. Slio, again, I understand your, your concern in regards to the scientific research and the medicinal purposes and the double blinded sander and whatnot. But if our government's been doing this for 30 years, the IND program, 30 years, what is that telling us? If our state, we believe in the Constitution, correct? You follow the Constitution. So I just want to see the difference between Antelope Valley abiding by state law and the Constitution. If San Bernardino County and San Diego County uphold in, in Supreme Court, it didn't. They have to allow medical marijuana ID cards and they have to allow medical marijuana dispensaries. We uphold the state law. We're not, we're not the federal here. And my question of concern is, you talk about leadership, you talk about putting back into the city and our tax dollars, you're looking at leadership. It took a lot of bravery to sit up here and talk about medical marijuana, bring these patients, our civilians that we've been here for years and some haven't. But I need a need. I have lupus. Do you know what lupus is like? Do you know what it's like to live with lupus every day with a three-year-old? And know that those other drugs can't work for you? See, what I'm asking here, Mayor Paris, is just sit with us. Let's build an ordinance. Let's put it in the agenda. Let's work together as a community how we can make medical marijuana safe access in the Antelope Valley. I mean, um, political observer, they're allowing us to, it's, this isn't advertising. This is just saying we're here to advocate, educate, and aware. A year ago, I looked at you in the face and I asked you, what can we do? And you said you didn't want to run from it. I don't want to run from it anymore. We don't want to be scared of the law. We're here to work with the law. You know, maybe once a month, a half an hour. Hi, it's Victoria. I'm here to educate you on the movement, what's going on once a month. You know, we could help that other, um, in Palmdale, that community, what was going on with the drunk drivers and all that. We could be there. We could help to educate, aware, advocate. Yes, kids shouldn't be with medical marijuana. That's how we're going to allow safe access. We can elicit all those other things that come bad. You know, the gangs, everything else that comes with this stigma. Again, research and science have struggled with the stigma on medical marijuana. I'm a patient, I'm an advocate, and I'm here in leadership. I'm not running away. I'm here to help. Uh, turn it off, please. Your assumption that I, am, I have a knee-jerk aversion to this is wrong. Uh, 
I have been meeting with some doctors in the community to see what their view is. And interestingly enough, they seem to support your view. Uh, you know, my, my profession, what I do for a living, is, is I deal with people in, in terrible pain all the time. And I'm not adverse to anything that would help them. Not anything that would help them. The, there is a tendency to have a knee-jerk reaction to say no to this. But there's a lot of very conservative uh, political leaders who I have a lot of respect for who are saying now's the time that we open the debate. That isn't to say we're going to approve anything. But I agree with you that it's time we open the debate. I'm happy to meet with anybody in regards to this, and I'm happy to invite the other council members to those meetings as long as we don't violate the Brown Act. But it, it, uh, and I'm and I'm open to having a public, uh, a community discussion about this. And what the city attorney tells me is we may be required to do this. He's not sure. Is, am I correct in that? Uh, I think that it is something that we need to do in light of the uh, federal government's announcement that they are no longer withholding funds from states that allow medical marijuana, uh, as does California per Prop 215. Um, I have provided, and in fact staff has done a very good job of, of researching the various ordinances that could be adopted, and they're working now on um, a draft ordinance. Uh, you know, I can't speak for staff when they'll have that that ready to come back to council. Okay. But there, there's there's a lot of misinformation uh, going around about what's allowed under Prop 215, what it does, and uh, it's not a, a complete solution to the legalization of marijuana for medical purposes. We and, and we don't. So, I mean, all of those things will be addressed right. when the ordinance is, is complete. And I think that's what our organization is looking for, is to work in, okay. in solution to resolve some form of ordinance. I mean, I was just at the one in Los Angeles City. I could bring members like Don Duncan from American for Safe Access, Dale Clare from Medical Cannabis Association. Um, I could bring in Bruce Margolin, he's an attorney, and so the, forth. The, the, the point I want to make to you is this, though, is, is I really believe you're sincere. Uh, I, I've never doubted that with you. You know, all of all of my training says, yeah, she, she's sincere. She's not trying to pull one over on us. If we do this, if we're required to do this, it's not going to be one of those things that, that you hear about down in Hollywood where every kid with a note comes in and gets a bunch of dope. I mean, it will be according to how the law is. It's, we're going to regulate it. It's not going to be a, an open thing uh, if we're required to do it, and if this council agrees we should do it, or if we should fight it. I think they all have very strong individual opinions. I, I don't know that having all of you come up right tonight is going to be beneficial to what you want to accomplish. I think this really needs to be something that needs to be set out in front of the community, where we invite the religious leaders, the medical leaders, and first, I'd like to see it go before the Criminal Justice Commission uh, and get their input on if we need to do this, how we should do it, and how do we do it in a way that, that benefits people instead of threatens our, our young people. Absolutely. Absolutely, I agree. I think putting an ordinance together and uh, sitting with us, because I understand you could have your staff and you could pay them and they could do the research. But So, research so let's itself do this. Is... You, you figure out who on your side of the table and, it's, and let me let me strike that. My fellow I don't, constituents. I don't want there to be sides of the table, but I do want the entire community interest represented in some kind of of meaningful series of meetings that that we can deal with this in a way that we can come to an intelligent decision on. Um, and uh, I'm happy to hear from the rest of you as to what your thoughts are. Uh, but what we're not going to do is bury our head in the sand. Oh, and, and you have been coming here a year, and I want to remind everyone that it only takes one council member to put something on the agenda. Nobody has asked me to put this on the agenda. No one has asked any of the council members to put it on the agenda. And so we oftentimes see this, this, 
view amongst the citizens that we're somehow against their ideas. We first have to ask us to put us put it on the agenda. I think it all started when I went in and I just put in my my license, my permit, and it was you know denied. And we have to talk about it. And you know I spoke with Brian a while back and how we can actually work this out and you know other ways. But I think it's just really sitting together and and just. And at the end out. of the day, we're going to follow the law. Absolutely. I mean. Absolutely. That's yeah. that's the long and the short We're of it. We're one of the 13 states that allow this. So, yeah, absolutely. So, Mr. Mayor, how could we put yes, this sir. on the agenda? Can I, can I make a suggestion? And we've done this in the past with the massage ordinance and the animal control ordinance where we've had significant constituencies that wanted to have input on ordinances. And we have done the draft ordinance and then scheduled meetings with the various groups to take input. And, and in each case, I think the, the ordinance was vastly improved as a result of getting that input. And I think this would be an area where we can do that. Um, you know, I, would, can I would like to direct staff to do that. But I do want everybody invited. I mean, I yes, want the I schools invited. I want the churches invited. I want the medical community invited. And then whoever wants to participate can participate. Don't invite the press. They'll just screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, though. For a year I've been coming. And I've been speaking on this, and I've been waiting for a year for somebody to come and say, that woman, she shouldn't be, I haven't heard it yet. I'm waiting, but. Well, I think, I think that comes with sincerity. I mean, I don't doubt your, your reasoning as to why you want this. Uh, I mean, I, I, I would just, if we're going to have to do it, I want to do it in a way, and I'm sure you do also, Absolutely. that it's not abused. I'm coming okay. here for acceptance, not forgiveness. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Oh, Mr. Mayor, it, it, I, I think that your first suggestion was the best. Before we put staff time into drafting an ordinance and getting together, I think it should go to the Criminal Justice Commission because, you know, having you know, Mr. McEwen and I and Mr. Bazigian, uh, we had a discussion about this today, about a miracle, medical marijuana ordinance. And there's some problems with it, and there's some other case law, and there's some, you know, what people think is legal uh, is not really legal, what they're doing in L.A., and they're just not having the enforcement. Uh, one of the things that was interesting, Mr. Uh, David Paul brought the article about the L.A. Times and all the medical marijuana uh, facilities they have. Well, they're unique in one way. The reason why they have so many of them is because they put a moratorium on them because they didn't want to get them, and they wanted to make a tougher ordinance. There was a loophole in their planning department, and everybody filed for an exemption without being on the radar of the council, and their planning department never had a hearing like they were mandated to do, so they got all these going through. Absolutely as soon as true. Councilman Zine said, okay, what's going on here? I got four on my block. You, you know, why isn't the planning department hearing these cases? I want to put make it tougher. All of a sudden, you had 450 requests for a waiver uh, go into LA City so and, and they're unique from any other city here so we can't really use LA before we work on an ordinance we wouldn't, wait a minute, we wouldn't use LA anyway yeah I know okay. that's, true. <laughs> that's true but but I'd like to see as Councilman Silly would I want to see some more information some facts and I'd like to see it vetted by our Criminal Justice Commission um, and, and like you've always said let, let's see the facts get the doctors involved before we take that step and, and put a lot of money and staff time into writing it ordinance that we might not even agree with in the first place. Well, I, I, haven't, I haven't asked anybody to write an ordinance, what, but I think the Criminal Justice Commission is probably the best organization to to work with you on vetting this and coming up with some ideas and solutions or or a recommendation of maybe not do it at all. What, but the, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the Criminal Justice Commission, but there's some exceptionally bright people on that commission, and it does represent the entire cross-section of the community. Uh, and I couldn't imagine them, if you could convince them that you would have any trouble convincing the rest of the community just because of who they are and how, you know, you got doctors and, and you know, should I say it, lawyers. And you, it's you a have, good commission have, anyway. You have pastors, and it's the right to, huh? <laughs> I said it's a good commission anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that almost passed the lawyer joke line. <laughs> uh, yes, it, it's it's one of the commissions that we're very proud of. Uh, so, M Mr. Bozigian, would you work with these folks and get that?
process rolling. And Victoria, uh, call my office, talk to Jody if you need to talk to me, if you think that you're being uh, being stalled in any way. But but we will put this on the the public docket. Okay. If, Mr. Mayor, if there's if, if there is, Mr. McCoon, if there is case law, she mentioned case law from San Diego County and San Bernardino County. I'd like to see those cases too. If we, I'll, I'll try to pull some. I'd those like to read those for you. Okay. You know, unfortunately, it wasn't just made a drug that you get through the pharmacy with the doctors prescribing it. I mean, the, the initiative really was stupid the way they did it, and it create, created more problems than it solved. It, it, if it's a viable medical drug, it ought to be handled like a viable medical drug by doctors and pharmacists. But unfortunately, idiocy prevailed. I have one other major uh, like issue. It usually does. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when you have initiatives? Yeah, that's right. I have one other major issue with medical marijuana, and, and no one's talked about it yet, given the presentation we had tonight by students against destructive decision. Um, and that's what happens if you get your prescription for medical marijuana and your driving privileges. How long does it stay in your system? What effect does it have? Can you treat it like alcohol? Is there a way to measure levels of THC in blood? I don't think so. That's, that's uh, terribly accurate. But that's just one of the many uh, secondary uh, uh, effects that a medical marijuana ordinance would have. That's one of the things we need to look at as well. You know, I totally agree. We need to look at everything. I also uh, recognize that it is the most prevalent drug out there. Our deputies don't even cite for it anymore. It, it, you know, we have this fantasy that we're somehow controlling something that we're not. And my understanding is you can go to Quartz Hill and buy it there in their uh, dispensary. That, don't they have a, what do you call these things? Medical marijuana dispensaries? Isn't there one right in Quartz Hill? Uh, that's okay, sorry, sorry. At least that's what I'm reading in the paper. I don't know if it's true. Do you know if it's true? Um, that came up at, yes, it came up last me. It was in the paper. There was some question whether they had gotten a proper permit or not, but it is in Quartz Hill. So there is, uh, there is a medical marijuana distribution center in Quartz Hill as we speak, and we're acting like we're controlling something. All we're controlling is whether people go to Quartz Hill or L.A., I think. Okay. All right, anybody else? Or do you want to do it the way we discussed? I'm, I'm sorry. Are you, are you on here? Oh, yeah, come on up then. Okay. Yeah. I haven't, I've only been up here. This is my second time. I get really nervous. Um, so I, I, I always try to take a deep breath first. Okay, I sent a proposal in with uh, David McEwen about six or seven weeks ago. And um, he had forwarded it back to City Hall, and from my understanding, I spoke with Randy, I've spoken with Sylvia, in regards to us implementing the uh, medical marijuana dispensary or, you know, a collective. And today she told me on the phone that um, it would take about a year, it would be, the ordinance would be written and it would be available next year. So. That's a long time. Well, that's probably because we're afraid of it coming out before the election. Okay, well, that's a long time. It's a year. I mean, okay, what are, what are we supposed to do with the patients that we, or the members slash patients that we have from now until then? If we have 250 patients and they're receiving their medication every day and we're all hiding out and taking medicinal marijuana to one person who has MS, taking their, their vaporizer to the shop to have it repaired, driving the other patient to the market, picking up his medication. How do we do this in, and keep hiding from this for another year? I, did, I didn't say we are going to hide from it. I'm telling you why that probably is why people would like it to take so long. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, part of me would like to see this after the election, not before the election. Uh, but I think that that would be wrong. I, I think that would be uh, cowardly. For, for me to do that, and, and I won't do that. 
Uh, but I do want it to proceed in an orderly process with people that I respect and admire and get everybody's input, and then we'll make a decision as to what we need to do to follow the law. And make no mistake, I, I do understand that there are some very sick people that this seems to benefit. And, yes, there is. And, and I, I don't want to be totally callous to that, and, and I'm not, okay? Uh, but this is the plan we're going to do. The, the city manager is going to arrange to get this moving in front of the Criminal Justice Commission. From the Criminal Justice Commission, we will have the community outreach to get some type of input. Uh, if that doesn't move on a, on, a, on a level that seems to me to be uh, consistent with people wanting to get the goal accomplished, which is to make a decision not to get medical marijuana dispensed in, in the city. The goal is to be able to make a decision that complies with the law and that will provide the most protection for our young people. I will do whatever I need to do to make certain that that moves in an orderly process uh, without unnecessary delay, regardless of when the election is. Okay? Okay, yeah, it's just that I've been here three years and been very discreet and took care of the people that need to be taken care of, and I'm just getting really tired of the fact that we have but to But you hide. and I have never talked, and I'm the mayor. I'm shy. I get nervous. I, I've been hiding. Then I went in City Hall one day, and I said, here I am, Well, and got to look courageous. You know, we're doing business differently. It's, it is open, and it is, you may not like what I decide, but you certainly know what I'm thinking, don't you? Yes, and I have okay. found that the Sheriff's Department has been Good. really nice to me. I mean, they knocked on my door by mistake, <laughs> looking for someone who had a DUI warrant, and lo and behold, here I was. Uh, not, I'm not the one with the warrant, excuse me, I mean, they said, I, you, is, everything <laughs> properly, is everything properly labeled? Is everything okay? Uh, you know, and that was it. Because I don't I think the sheriff's department anything. cares about medical marijuana. I don't think that. And that's I wasn't part trying to hide mission. anything. So. But we'll find out because we're going to be asking them to put in input too. You well, know. I found them to be pretty, pretty cool about the whole thing. Yeah, we think they're pretty cool too. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Yes, sir. Come on down. What's your name? Sergio, you have a card. I saw that. First of all, good evening, Mayor, Council Members. My name is Sergio Pena. I have been a Lancaster resident for over 20 years. I have seen the city grow, change in many ways. Now straight to the point. I am here for safe access for my medicine. I am a patient. I believe that I should have a dispensary here in town so I can have access to my medicine and in return we make the community safer and help stimulate our community with revenue. Also, we put local illegal drug dealers out of business, thus make the city safer. This is one issue we have in common. Medical marijuana is not dope, as in the last meeting it was said by one of the council members. There is a big difference between medical marijuana. It is a medicine prescribed by a licensed doctor. The word dope is best fit for a real drug that has destroyed many lives and continues to destroy lives here in this community. Methamphetamine is the real drug that we should be attacking, not a medicine used to ease pain and help fight many diseases. So I think it's time to stop discriminating against our organization and allow a dispensary to open in this town. Approve, just approve the permit, safe access now. Also in the community of Lancaster patients, we are 300 plus and we are a diverse bunch of people from every gender, race, and religion. And to add, if we believe that, everyone should be respectful and treated fair. Why not bring change? When I say this, when I say this, I, everybody agrees with me on this. If you could stand there and support our cause, we could stand there and support you at voting time. Thank you very much. Safe access. Okay, uh, Mr. Bozigian, can we have some kind of plan as to how this is going to progress uh, within the next two weeks? 
Um, yes, we're going to bring it up with the Criminal Justice Commission at their next meeting on June 3rd, and then we will go about that. I still believe, as Dave and I were talking, we're going to have some kind of an outline of the issues because if we don't, we're not going to get anywhere. I agree. And we'll start with that. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Anyone else that has a speaker card? Okay, thank you. Now, how come all my buddies out there are giving me these hard looks? <laughs> All I said is we're going to talk about it. Oh, okay. Council reports. Vice Mayor Smith. Yes, sir. Mayor, Mayor Paris. Yes, sir. I'm sorry for anyone before they leave. That meeting is actually June 10th at the Criminal Justice Commission. June 10th. You got that? Okay. Good. Mr. Mayor, uh, we have the uh, report from the AQMD. There's a couple things I'd like to highlight, two of them that, um, that I've been working on for a, a number of years now on, on the panel. Uh, one is our fugitive dust abatement. Uh, we're getting a, an update on it. A lot of people have asthma or allergies out here, and so we're trying to find a way that the city and the uh, AQMD can partner and actually maybe get a bond or something that when somebody doesn't take care of their dust abatement that we can hire water trucks and go take care of it. So, we're, so it's getting really close to being done. Um, also, a number, of, a couple of years ago, the AQMD wanted to raise business license fees 14% just because they could. And um, I was able to stop that, but I've asked for a cost analysis, uh, cost allocation analysis, and so they've done it. We're actually finding ways that we could probably uh, save money and also uh, charge people the fair pay-for-play business license. But one of the great things that happened that the AQMD did, and this is the county and the city of Palmdale and us together, is we had a lawnmower trade-in. And they went down there, uh, if you know where they do the recycling down at the uh, at waste management. We were giving out, and I think it, I think it was $200 gift certificate for a trade-in. If you turn in your gas-powered mower, we give you a $200 gift certificate to get an electric mower. Within the first hour, they gave out 45, and they had a pile of these gas. They ended up giving out 56, uh, 56 certificates. And um, I forgot the name of the, um, the lawnmower that people are going and getting, but it's online. I think it's Neutron, or I think it's Neutron, is it? And it's actually a battery-powered one. I have an electric mower at home, but I got that long extension cord. <laughs> is it a BYG battery? BYD? No, no, I don't know. I don't know if those are not trying yeah. to cover. It would be good. <laughs> so that, that, that was great, you know, and we're going to do the same program next year and, uh, and give out so many. We have some, you know, Moyer money and some other monies, uh, grant monies that we get for doing that. But, uh, but that's great. It was a good program. Thank you very much. Mr. Cilio? Uh Yes, there's actually a report. It uh, has my name on it. Actually, it's from our very capable environmental engineer, Mr. Peter Zorba. He is the primary uh, representative to the Restoration Advisory Board at Edwards Air Force Base, but I did want to circulate it to the other council members in case they had any questions for me or, or for Mr. Zorba. Thank you. Council members? Comments? Okay. Uh, I have a few. I'm going to uh, request that Dale DeBry uh, lead the committee to discuss the renaming of the park, uh, the park naming policy, and develop uh, recommendations for honoring American heroes within the American Heroes Park. We discussed that at the last meeting. Uh, and uh, she'll be working with the uh, city staff in developing a group of people, to, and some people have applied, and we will look at them and get this group together so we can make some progress relatively quickly on that. I understand she has agreed to do this. Is that yes, right? Yes, she has, sir. Thank you. Uh, oh, also, I've been getting mail that people are complaining that the Lancaster gift card that they get, that we distributed, the, uh, you know, the shop local cards, that in Lancaster, you have to use them in Lancaster, but Palmdale, they can use them anywhere, and people are upset that Lancaster can't be used anywhere. Do you know anything about that? Um, I believe that's the case. Our program, we intended to make sure that the $300,000 $300, was spent in Lancaster so we couldn't use a Visa card. We had to come up with this. <coughs> Excuse me, I believe Palmdale's program uses a Visa card, which can be used anywhere, and that's how you track it. Um, 
the intent of Can we advertise that they come use it in Lancaster? <laughs> <laughs> we are in a sense right now. Um, <laughs> we accept Palmdale gift cards. <laughs> See, that, that's apparently our slogan. <laughs> One thing, though, one of the benefits of it just being used in Lancaster, and it drove it home to me the other day, was that um, Giovanni's, as an example, great new Italian restaurant on Avenue M and 10th Street West, over $1,100 worth of gift cards have been used there. Well, that's not just $1,100. That's their opportunity to make long-term customers. Someone may come in there, but, you know, that's 50, 60 people that they have the opportunity to make long-term customers. So that's why we wanted to recirculate it. Um, but yes, the gift cards can only be used in Lancaster and only at participating businesses, which is about 500 and some. So that, just so the record's clear, Giovanni's is the mayor's favorite restaurant next, next to the Costco hot dogs. Just so we're all clear. <laughs> so, so you're saying that the Palmdale, the Palmdale one is a Visa card, so you could actually even just go down to L.A. and spend it and use it. You could use that any place that takes Visa. That, yes, that, that is my a Visa card like you would buy at a Walmart or a Target. It cannot be restricted to any particular location. I believe that's, yes, if you're using a Visa card, it cannot be restricted to anywhere that, unless it, they don't take Visa. Yes, Mr. Cilio, they can use it at the medical marijuana dispensary in Quartz Hill. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay. For that, I think I owe you a Being said. <laughs> uh, we're going to have, this is our third closed session. I haven't been counting the number of closed sessions, but yes, we are going to have a closed session. We really have to do this. Huh? Yes, sir. We, we are going to adjourn to a closed session to discuss litigation. Does that mean we're being sued? Anticipated litigation under Government Code Section 54956.9b. Oh, somebody messed up, huh? I guess I'll no, find I'm out. No, I'm just adding stuff to it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. After the closed session, we're going to come out and adjourn. But if you want to wait around for us to adjourn, you can. And if not, I'll see you all in two weeks. Thank you for coming. We agree. We agree. Okay, we're reconvened and we will hear from the city attorney. Mr. Mayor, the council met in closed session under government code section 54956.9b to consider anticipated litigation, gave direction to the city attorney considering that. Thank you. Uh, I guess we have nothing else, right? We'll adjourn until June 9th, 2009 at 6 p.m. And Carol, my day is done and I'm coming home and it was a terrible day.